Well, good morning. Thank you all for coming today. It sure is good to see you. Trust that everybody's having a good week. Today, I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. Remember, you just go over to Ezekiel and hang a right, and you'll be in Daniel. Last week, if you'll recall, we talked about faith in the fiery furnace. And so that would have been about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, today, it was my intention to talk on <laughs> faith in the lion's den. But I just have to tell you, I'm not 100% sure we're going to get there this morning. Uh, I, 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 I want to lead into that kind of, because there's a whole lot that's going on in the book of Daniel. So I want to, uh, uh, I want to look at something here, kind of going back. Uh, you'll, you'll recall that the nation of Israel has gone into captivity. The Babylonian Empire, led by Nebuchadnezzar, has come into the land. And if you'll recall, the kingdom has split. Israel has split. It's no longer a united kingdom. After Solomon... Right after Solomon passed away, the kingdom went to Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And so the kingdom split. You had the northern kingdom, which was known as Israel, and you had the southern kingdom known as Judah. The northern kingdom, the capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. Most people get that wrong on a test. The capital of the southern kingdom, Judah, was Jerusalem. Jerusalem it was still... Jerusalem was associated with Judah. Now remember, years ago, I, I haven't taught on this in a long time. Remember I taught on the kings of Israel? And uh, we also went through the kings of Judah. And, I, and I, one of the things that I described to you during that, I said one of the, one of the ways for you to, to notice this particular characteristic, if you ever see a good report on a king in your Bible, it wasn't Israel. There is not, after the kingdom split from Solomon... There is not a good report on any king in Israel. All of them had bad reports. All of them had bad reports. Now, some of them in Judah did too, but also kings had Josiah. Actually, King Josiah is the one with the best report of any king in the whole Bible. I don't know if y'all knew that. You'd think it would be David, but, it, but the best report written in your Bible of any king was Josiah, king of Judah. So the kingdom is split, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they still kind of come together to fight common enemies and stuff, but, but, but they've split, and now you've got a, a capital in Samaria, and then you've got the capital in Jerusalem. Well, what happens is the Babylonians come in, and, and they come in from the north, so the northern kingdom is Israel. And, and my point being that the kingdoms did not, were not captured at the same time. Do any of you know the dates of when they were captured? Andrew, do you remember the dates of when they were captured? You're a good son. Northern Kingdom went when? 722. Not only is he a good son, he's smart. Too. And Southern Kingdom? 586. Now, the Southern Kingdom, there's kind of a little bit of discrepancy because the siege took like two years. And, so there, and there's arguments about that. But what I want to show you is there's a period of time of about... 40 years or so that went by. So this isn't, when you're reading through your Bible, it looks like it happened on one page and then this happened on the next page. There's not, there's a span of, of, of 40 years or so that went by from the, from the difference in Israel being taken into captivity and Judah taken into captivity. Now, if you'll recall, what happened is when the Babylonians came in, they, uh, they took away some of the people, not all the people, they took away the people that were craftsmen. They took away the people that were really smart and well-learned. They took away the teenagers that showed great promise. And they left a group of people behind. So one of the things that you've got to recall is during the whole uh, uh, Babylonian captivity, there were still natural Jews that were still in the land. Well, what happened is when the decree was given, when Cyrus let them come back into the land uh, 70 years later, 
when they come back into the land, these people have still been there. They have, they have still been conducting business. They've still been li- they've, having families. They, they, they have been living off of the land. Now, it's been tough, but nevertheless, they've done it. And what has happened is, is now then when, when the decree is issued and the ones that have gone in captivity come back into the land, there is enmity between the people that are there and the ones that have gone away. Primarily, the ones that remained or were left behind, we know them in the New Testament stories as what group of people? The Samaritans. That's who the Samaritans were. So the Samaritans were looked down upon because you weren't smart enough, you weren't good enough, you weren't whatever enough to even go into captivity. You, you, were, the, you were the bottom. You were the, you, were the, you were the rejects. You were the left behinds. And so there was this uh, friction between the two groups of people, and Jesus used several stories illustrating the Samaritans. So it, it's confusing. There is a city called Samaria, and if you lived in that city, you would have been a Samaritan. <laughs> in the New Testament, there is a region that is called Samaria. And you have in the very north of Israel, during, during New Testament times, the very north is Galilee. That's where Jesus was uh, from. That's where he's from Nazareth. Nazareth is in Galilee in the north country. Then in the central part of the, of the country is Samaria. And that's where the Samaritans are from. That's who Jesus was talking about. The, the parable of the Good Samaritan was somebody that was from that region. And then you had the southern region which would have been Judah, which is where Jerusalem and Bethlehem are located. Well, isn't that interesting that it's it's almost like you've got a division again. It's almost like you've got a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom with the Samaritans in the middle. It's just, it's a really interesting dynamic that uh, if you understand that, it kind of enlightens you to where, or, 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 or it helps you understand better some of the parables in the New Testament. Uh, The Samaritans did not like the Jews, and the Jews did not like the Samaritans. And whenever people in Galilee were going to Jerusalem, they had to go through Samaria. But when when the people in Galilee were going to Jerusalem and they needed to stop to spend the night, the Samaritans wouldn't let them. They said, nope, you're a Jew, keep going. Keep it going, buddy, keep it going. No room for you, no, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Now, that's a real interesting thing over in Luke chapter 9. That's what happened when Jesus told the young man, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a a place to lay his head. If you'll go back and look in in Luke chapter 9, you will see that's what happened. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and they were in Samaria. It wasn't that Jesus was poor or broke. It's that they, they couldn't find a place to stay that night because they were going to Jerusalem. It says that in your Bible. It says, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. It, and it says it very clearly. Okay. So this is kind of the, uh, uh, the circumstances that are going on right now. And Daniel has gone away in the last bunch, okay? He, he's, he's been taken away in the Judean bunch. Now, he actually precedes the final fall of Judah. Uh, Daniel is taken away somewhere between 605 and 600, somewhere, somewhere in that range is when he's taken into captivity. So he's in the land. He, he and his three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, have found great favor in this new land. They've shown great promise. They've been found to be ten times smarter than the children in, in uh, Babylon. And so they're, they're really doing well, and they're being promoted. Now, you know what's going to happen uh, when you have these foreigners that have been brought back, and they start being elevated. The, the people that are uh, the natives, the, uh, the, the, the native Babylonians, are really upset. They don't like that. Well, how many of you know that the king just wants the best people that he can get around him, if he's smart, and... Nebuchadnezzar in some ways was smart. I mean, kings want people around them that are really smart. They don't want dumb people around them. Uh, they, their advisors said they want to be smart. So these guys were doing well. And then we saw, we looked last week at the plot 
that happened, that, that came about as a result uh, of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to bow down and worship the image. Now, I kind of flew over that particular story quickly last week because I wanted to get to the fiery furnace. But I want to go back for just a moment and I want to kind of look at something here that I think will be a blessing to you. Uh, it'll, it, it'll, really, uh, it'll really help you in some things. So, in Daniel chapter 2, what has happened is Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. And it's a dream that has concerned him and he doesn't know what it means. So he tells all of the wise men, all of his advisors, I want to know what this dream means. Now then Daniel and his buddies are in that group. They were part of the ones that this decree went out. And so Nebuchadnezzar sends his, his right-hand man out to, to tell all of them, personally. He, he's going out and tell them, he said, listen, the king's ordered a decree, and um, he's had a dream, and he needs it interpreted. But the thing that is really interesting about this dream is, he's not going to tell you what the dream is. You have to tell him what the dream was and what it meant. Now, that's sneaky. Because, see, he could have told you the dream, and then you could have just made something up. But no, Nebuchadnezzar says, I want you to tell me what the dream is and the interpretation. And he says, and by the way, those of you that can't do that, I'm going to cut you asunder, I'm going to burn you, and your house is going to be made into a trash heap. It's a little extreme, don't you think? But that's what he says. So the word gets to Daniel. Daniel tells the chief, he says, listen, I can do this, but I need some time to pray. We, we, the, the Lord will show me what that is. So they gave Daniel uh, a few days. Daniel prayed about it, got the dream, the answer, and came before Nebuchadnezzar and told him the dream. Now, uh, when he starts explaining the dream, he tells Nebuchadnezzar, he says, now I want you to look in verse 28 of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to write a few things down probably this morning. Daniel says, But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the what? What will be in the what? Do you think it's possible that this dream might apply to the Latter days. I think there's a good chance, since that's what it says. So Nebuchadnezzar, these, these things will apply to the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while your bed that would come to pass after this, and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching and beheld a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. Now I want you to start noticing here in verse 32. He's starting to describe the image. This image's head was a fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs. Now that word thighs is misleading there. It means a, a, a side. It's talking about the belly and the sides. The torso were of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone cut out with hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Okay, so he said... This is the dream that you had. You had a dream, and there was this great image that was before you, and uh, this image had a head, and the head was gold. 
and then its torso was of silver, and its or its chest and arms were of silver, its torso was of bronze, and then its legs and feet were of iron and clay. So, an unusual image, wouldn't you think? I mean, it's, it's made up of different uh, uh, elements, different minerals. So, this is the uh, interpretation now, O king. This is what this means to you. You, O king, are a king of kings, for God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's failure to recognize that particular thing cost him in just two chapters. He goes crazy. But Daniel tells him where his strength and power have come from. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them to, into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Okay, all right. In case we're wondering, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar who the head of gold is, right? Do we have to wonder who that is? Is it the Antichrist? No. Who is it? Nebuchadnezzar. But after you shall arise another what? It didn't say another heir. Didn't say your offspring. It said after you shall arise another. By the way, this is why the image is made up of different elements. There's, there's not continuity to it. So it's, it's, it's broken up. Different elements. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Huh. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break into pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. Just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which, will, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. So what's the last kingdom? I mean, he's telling you right here. The kingdom of stone that comes in and crushes everything is what? The kingdom of God. Insomuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it broke into pieces of iron, bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king... What will come to pass after this, the dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and he commanded that they should present an offering of incense to him. And the king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal the secret. All right, now right there you think, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, bless his heart, he's, he's doing good. He's, he's getting this. Nebuchadnezzar, all right. Yours is the one true God. Yours is the, the God of gods, the Lord of lords. Then the king pro, uh, promoted Daniel, and he gave him many gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, chief administrator over the wise men of Babylon. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego above the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat at the gate of the king. Okay. If you're writing things down, this is something you may want to write down. There are, in your Bible... Six main kingdoms that are talked about in your Bible. And by the way, six is the number of what? Man. There are six main kingdoms in your Bible. And it lists them in order. The kingdoms that we see ruling in our Bible are these. This is in order. Egypt. Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, the image 
that Nebuchadnezzar sees, Daniel tells him that the head of this image made of gold is you. So in that timeline, which kingdom are we talking about? Where does this particular image, this particular vision, this particular dream, where does it pick up? It picks up at Babylon. Egypt and Assyria are not mentioned in this dream. So the head of gold is Babylon. Then you drop down to the chest and arms of silver, and that is Persia. And then you drop down to the belly and the sides, it says thighs here, but sides, the torso, and that is bronze, which is Greece. And then you drop down to the legs. By the way, how many legs do you think that image had? Two. How many toes do you think it had? Ten. Does that ring a bell to you over in the book of Revelation? About the ten kingdoms over in the book of Revelation? What a coincidence. The legs and the feet, the iron and the clay, is the kingdom of Rome. And one of the things, the, the reason for that, the reason for the legs, which is two, if you'll recall, the Roman Empire split. The Roman Empire started in Rome, and then, you remember Constantine? Emperor Constantine? Okay. The, king, the, the, the Roman Empire split during his rule, and he set up a new capital over in, oddly enough, Constantinople. I wonder who that was named for. Over Constantinople. Constantinople is uh, modern-day Istanbul in Turkey. Okay? So you had the Roman Empire that was split. You, you had the, the, the uh, Roman Empire, the western part would have been the, in Rome, and then the eastern part would have been in present-day Istanbul, Turkey. Um, the, uh, the eastern also meshed into the Byzantines, okay? So you have the Byzantine Empire, which we don't talk about a whole lot, but that was an awesome, awesome empire, is, is in the east. And, okay, so that's, that's the split. So it's the same kingdom, it's just split into two. Didn't Daniel say the vision I'm giving you is for the what? That, was Greece a world power at this time? No. What was it? Uh, uh, Alexander the Great was in like 280 something, you know, right around 300 BC. 286 something in there, you know, if memory serves me correctly. So, you know, we're, we're several hundred years from, from the Greeks coming into power. Well, Rome certainly hadn't come in. You know, I mean, they're, they're hardly known of at this time. So, Daniel gives this vision and this prophecy, if you will, about what is happening. Now, uh, the, the thing that is really interesting is he... Um, I just thought it was... On, actually, Andrew and I were talking about this. <clears throat> and... Uh, he, he had an interesting point. If, if you look in chapter 3, now, you understand that the image is mixed, right? It, it's, it's gold, it's silver, it's bronze, and it's iron and clay. Is that, is that right? Is that what we just read? Okay. I want you to notice in chapter 3, Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. All right, all right, all right. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 90 feet. It was 90 feet tall. Nine stories tall. <laughs> Reckon where he got that idea. How did he come up with that? What do you think could have possibly prompted him to build an image 90 feet tall? Maybe the dream that he had? <laughs> uh, let's see how he made this thing. 
He's supposed to make the head out of gold, the chest and the arms out of silver, the belly and the sides out of bronze, and the feet out of iron and clay, right? We just, we just read that. Okay. So, Nebuchadnezzar, after Daniel told him the dream and interpreted it, Oh, praise the God of Daniel. Oh, he's so awesome. He's the God of gods. He's the Lord of lords. He's the top. He's the utmost. Okay. I paraphrased that last part. The king made an image of gold. Okay, he's, he's got part of it right. Whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather all the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the officials, um, to come to the dedication of King Nebuchadnezzar set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, and all these other guys that he named, uh, what happened, the image, they gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried, okay, so what's happening, and we looked at this last week. So what's happening is, is, is Nebuchadnezzar has said, all right, we've built this image. Now look, here again, you read in your Bible and just a few verses have gone by. This took time to build this thing. It is 90 feet tall. They just didn't have those laying around. You know, I mean, they had, had to build it. By the way, what is the image made out of? Any silver, bronze, iron, clay. What's it made out of? Huh. What part of the vision was Nebuchadnezzar? The head that was made out of gold. Now, if you were a king, and someone had just come in and interpreted a dream as precisely as Daniel had. And in that dream, you learned that your kingdom was going to be replaced. Would you be happy about that? Would you be excited that you were going to be replaced? Praise the Lord! Another kingdom is going to come in here and defeat us, and we're going to have to uh, be servant to them. Isn't God good? <laughs> no. I mean, yeah, God is good, but no, He wouldn't like that. So do you notice what he's done? He's taken the image that the Lord had given him a vision about. He's taken the image and he's changed it. He doesn't want to give in to that next kingdom. And as a matter of fact, Daniel says a kingdom that's inferior to yours. Now, you remember in our line a while ago, Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, and the... Persian Empire. So the next, next one up is Persia. Right? Now you know when we read our Bible it's very easy for us to see that. Because it's right there. It's history. It's already happened. But for them in that day, they didn't know. So, so Nebuchadnezzar says, look, if I build this whole thing out of gold and it represents me, it'll last forever. Now then, it doesn't say precisely in our Bible. But biblical scholars, theologians, people a lot smarter than me, think that this image was made of Nebuchadnezzar, that Nebuchadnezzar made an image of himself. So they were actually worshiping. Now, come on, think for just a moment. You know how kings were back in those days? Didn't all kings think of themselves as a god? Yeah. And so they thought of themselves as a god, and then when something would happen and somebody would give them an interpretation, uh, uh, an Israelite would give them an interpretation, they just thought of the God of Israel as another God like them. Now, a few kings during the Old Testament got the revelation that the God of Israel, <laughs> He's the real God. He's far above all the gods on the earth. And Nebuchadnezzar got it for three or four verses. But then he gets this idea, huh, you know, if I don't make that to represent all these other kingdoms, if I just make that image, and I could kind of make it look like me, uh, I could make that image look like me a little bit, and uh, I could make it all gold, which is my part, then those other kingdoms won't come and destroy me. 
pretty good thinking, huh? So that's what the image was that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship. Now then, I want to talk to you for just a moment about the sovereignty of God. There are are people, we would actually be in this particular group. There are people that believe that God is sovereign. I believe that God is sovereign. Now, when people say that God is sovereign, what they mean by that is, God can do anything He wants to do. That's not what that means. God has set up a system in the earth. And that system is set up based on covenant. God operates with us based on covenant. God has a kingdom. And in that kingdom, there is currency. Like we use... I left mine in my office. But... uh, uh, we use currency. We have, you know, paper money. And we have, I call that quiet money. And then you have the jingle loud money. Noisy money. So that's our currency. Well, heaven has a currency also. And that currency is called faith. You use your faith to procure things in the kingdom. You don't get things in the kingdom just because you need them, just because you want them, just because God's a good God, just because God's a God of love. You get them based on that covenant by using the currency of heaven, which is faith. Now, it doesn't matter whether you think it ought to work that way or not. It, God in His sovereignty set that up, and that's the way that it works. But now then what happens is people start applying the sovereignty of God to mean a lot of different things that I don't think are accurate. They apply the sovereignty of God to mean that everything that happens is God's plan. Now, I don't believe that's true, and I've got the Bible to back me up on that. Everything that happens in your life is not ordained of God to happen to you. You've got to remember, there is a wicked one, there is an enemy out there that has a plan for your life also. And just as God's plan is to prosper you and to give you a hope in a future, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, that's only one place that the will of God is told, God's plan for us. There's many places in the Bible. God desires good things for you. The Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no sh- uh, uh, variableness nor shadow of turning. God is the author of good things. He gives you good things. So when bad things come into your life, it's not God putting those things into your life to teach you something. You cannot find a verse of Scripture in the New Testament that says that. It's not in there. But there is an enemy, the thief, Jesus called him in John 10.10, and he said, he's got a plan for you, just as I have a plan for you, or just as the Father has a plan for you, He has a plan for you. And that plan is to kill you, to steal from you, or to destroy you. So it seems to me to be something that's really easy. If something is trying to kill you, steal you, or destroy you, it's the devil. It's the enemy. I have heard people ad nauseum talk about the pandemic that's going on right now is God's way of getting the church to turn back towards Him. Have you lost your ever-loving mind? See, that, that shows me a tremendous, highly developed ignorance. First of all, God doesn't have, as we say, the coronas. He doesn't have it. It's not His. He's not the one that kills, steals, and destroys. So, that only leaves one other player. So who do you think's unleashed that thing? It's the enemy. Now then, is it possible that the release of that will cause people to turn to God? Yes, 
but God didn't send it, nor did he allow it. That's a whole other deal, and I'm not getting into that. But, but God allowing something to happen and him doing, he's just as guilty. Okay, In the court of law, you allowing something to happen and you doing something, you're still guilty. It's just lesser degree, but still guilty. This is judgment that's come up on the church. Because, we, because we've done da 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 there is judgment that's come up on the church. Uh, if, if, you, if you don't mind, I, I would, I'd, like, I'd be interested in the New Testament if you could find a verse of Scripture that tells us that God judges the church to perfect us. It's not in there. I, I can help you. It's not in there. Now, people say that. Well, it purifies our works. That's not what that's talking about. It's testing our, God's testing our faith. That passage of Scripture in James chapter 1, you get down to verse 17, He tells you, let no, one's, no man say when he's tested that he's tested of God, for God cannot be tested with evil, neither tests he any man. God proves you. He doesn't test you. There's a difference in those things. We've talked about that before. So, what happens is there are things, God is a sovereign God. But what happens when we talk about sovereignty is we completely remove man's part to play in this, where your particular life is concerned. You have a lot of say-so in your life. Matthew chapter 18 says that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Those words bind and loose, we don't talk that way today. We say prohibit or allow. And Jesus, written in red in your Bible, He says, you're the one that's doing the allowing, and you're the one doing the prohibiting. He's the one that backs up what you decree. It's in your Bible. I, one of the best illustrations I've heard of this, and, and I don't want to put you on the spot, maybe you remember the, the, uh, the official theological name for this, but one, this is one of the best descriptions I've ever heard about God's sovereignty and God's plan for man. God's sovereignty is like you getting on a cruise ship. And you get on a cruise ship in England, and you're coming across to New York Harbor. Okay? When you get on that ship, where is the ship going? To New York. Do you have any say-so where it's going? No. Can you go tell the captain, hey, listen, I need you to take a right turn up here, or I need you to take a left turn, let's go down by the Azores. Nope. The captain has a route that he is following, and he is navigating that course. And at the end of the journey, you're going to be in New York City. Okay? Now then, while you're on that ship going from England to New York, who decides what you eat? Who? You do. Who decides what theater you go to? You do. Who decides what time you get up? You do. Who decides who gets to go uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the zip line? You do. And you can also decide, I don't want to do it. So on that ship where it's going... You have say-so in the things that are going on in your life. You're the one that has the authority within certain guidelines. Now, you can't do anything you want to do. There are still rules and regulations that are on that ship that you have to abide by. You can't just do anything. We're just all free. <laughs> no, no, no. They, they do have jail on those ships, too. You do know that, don't they? They, they do have sails. They, 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 yeah, they do. I've heard. So, God's plan, when you look in our Bible, there is a plan that starts in the book of Genesis, and it's laid out. And that plan, we know how long the, we know how long the journey is going to take from Europe, from, I mean, from London to uh, New York. And in the Bible, that journey is going to take 6,000 years. And then, 
after 6,000 years, we're going to have a party for 1,000 years. And it's going to be wonderful. And then this whole planet is going to be recreated again. That's what your Bible says. Now that timetable is going along and you can't do a thing to stop it. You can get you and 7,000 nuns coming together and praying and you're not going to change it. That it, there is a time to, as a matter of fact, you remember over in Isaiah 46.10? Isaiah 46.10 uh, says, uh, I am the Lord declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God says that he says, I declare, I declare the end from the beginning. In other words, he sees the whole thing that's going to happen. One of the things that is very interesting about the story of Daniel would you think at this point that Daniel has some validity? Would you think that Daniel nailed this really well? Well, in the next chapter, there's another dream. Nebuchadnezzar apparently slept a lot. Uh, there's another dream, and he interprets this dream. And when he interprets this dream, it gets somebody else in trouble. Daniel. And then you go into... Now then the kingdoms change. The, the, you have the Babylonian kingdom that now gives away to the Persian kingdom. And, and it happens within a few chapters here. And then you get over into Daniel chapter 9. Do you know what Daniel chapter 9 is about? End times. Last days. A lot of what we believe on end times we get out of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is the passage of Scripture that Jesus held the city of Jerusalem responsible for. When He wept over the city and He said, you did not know, He said, you're going to be destroyed. There is not going to be one stone left upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. And He held them accountable for it because Daniel chapter 9 tells them to the day when he is going to appear in the streets of Jerusalem. And you go back and add these up, it tells you to the exact precise time after Artaxerxes issues the decree for Israel to be released out of captivity and to go back into to the, to their land. That's when Daniel gives the command. That's when Daniel starts the clock. He also talks about the 70 weeks. Exactly. Now, boys and girls, if he's nailed this thing in these first two visions, and history tells us that it came to pass exactly like he said, and you don't have to get too far down, the people he was telling it to saw it happen. Exactly the way the Lord revealed it to him. Then don't you think we can have confidence in what Daniel says in chapter 7 and in chapter 9? Yes. We serve an awesome God who lays things out for us, gives us signposts along the way to make sure that we're on the right path, leading us in the right direction. I've, I've ministered the last several weeks on God's protection. God's protection applies to you. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter whether they have a vaccine or not. God's protection still applies to you. And it's far more powerful than any of that. But it doesn't happen just because you want it to happen. It happens when you apply faith, the currency of heaven. Well, I'm going to stop here for today. As you can tell... We didn't get to the lion's den. Well, I'm going to try to get there next week. I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to next week. But I'm going to try to get there next week, Daniel and the lion's den, because that's an awesome story also. So we'll close there for today. Did y'all get anything out of that today? Okay. Good. Well, at this time, we'd like to receive our morning tithes and offerings. If you would like to participate, would you please stand up? With me, and we'll do our morning confession. You can fill your envelopes out uh, in just a moment. But let's do our morning.
offering confession. Everybody together, simultaneously, repeat after me, read off the screen. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increased. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you so very much for joining us this morning. My desire is that God's richest and best be yours. And remember, there is victory in Jesus.